So excited that you're all here tonight. Um, I'm just going to make a couple brief uh, opening remarks and then hand it over to Mason, who's the president of the Road Foundation. Um, first of all, the way that this is going to work, I just want everybody to understand the ground rules. We're going to spend about 30 or 45 minutes uh, with uh, Mason, Commissioner Watkins, Bob Hughes. We're going to give you guys a lot of background. There's been a lot of progress made since the last time we gathered here uh, and over the past year as the work has gone on on row. And so we wanted to make sure everybody was up to date on what we're doing. That's not going to be a Q&A period, so they're going to work through all that. And I guarantee you a lot of your questions are going to be answered as they move through the presentation. After the presentation, if your questions haven't been answered, uh, then we're going to split into four, five different stations. Mason's going to give an overview of those stations um, afterwards. And at that point, we're going to have experts at every one of those stations where you can get your questions answered, go deep on transportation, the environment, uh, all things Gwinnett back in the corner. So Mason will walk you through who is where, uh, and we will work on that and go through that together afterwards. We are going to have to wrap up at 8 o'clock, so we all like visiting, but, um, you know, for the sake of everybody's calendar and time, and we have people have to break down and wrap up in this building, we will shut down by 8, so um, do try to get to the station and ask your questions that you have, or visit all of them and ask the questions that you have. But again, we're thrilled that you're here tonight. Um, if you had, need anything, if you have questions about communications, how to stay in touch with Rowan, come find me, happy to answer those questions and get you whatever you need. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mason Aylstock, the president of the Rowan Foundation. Thank you, Brian, and uh, good evening to everyone. It's so great to be with you. Uh, on, a, on a really important milestone, a new chapter for Rowan. Uh, this, this town hall event has been a long time in the making. Brian mentioned the last time we were here in this room and then many meetings between then. We've been out in the community sharing the vision of Rowan and inviting input, thoughts, uh, direction, insights to, to in, you know, inform our thinking around what, what Rowan should become and, and how we can build a place that really is a destination for generations in the future and how we can do that together. Um, before we get started, I wanted to invite Madison from Java Joy to share a few words about Java Joy and the great work that they do. If you haven't grabbed uh, a cup of coffee or uh, hot chocolate, please do feel free to get up and do that. But Madison, if you could offer some thoughts. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Madison. I am an AmeriCorps member for Java Joy Athens. So JobJoy actually in the last year has launched a total of three cities. So we have an Athens location, an Atlanta location, and a Rome location. So this same exact thing that is happening right here tonight happens in Rome, in Atlanta, every day of the week. It's super amazing. So what JobJoy is, is a nonprofit organization that came from ESP, Extra Special People, which in, is in Watkinsville, Georgia. And we provide after school and summer camp to individuals of all abilities. We, it's the most amazing experience that I ever got involved in four years ago, which is how I'm here in front of you today, because I'm hopefully never going to leave. So we also, I wanted to let you know, we have a permanent car at Mercedes-Benz. So if you find yourself anywhere at Mercedes-Benz, at a concert, potentially a passion conference in January, any football game, we're there outside of section 116, and that is our Atlanta friends, and it's a super fun way to get connected. Like I said, I'm Madison. JobJoy is a nonprofit that is a mobile coffee cart, and what I say is we like to interrupt a workplace. So just like tonight, we love to come into your space and bring joy, and bring our joy, joy recess, bring coffee, bring hugs, and bring a lot of fun. So I hope you guys were able to come out there, get a cup of coffee. If not, we're here until 7.30, if you want to refill, or if you just want to come hang out with the Dorista, it's the best part of my job is our 50 minute rides to events when we get to just talk and laugh and share all of the, the fun experiences that we have on a daily basis. If you have any questions about Java Joy and want them to be in your city or around here just as an event, please come find me. I'll give you a business card, my email, and all the things. And thank you so much to the Rowan Foundation for having us out here tonight so that we can spread some Java Joy to you guys. So thank you. Thank you, Madison. Um, just a really wonderful group and uh, one of the things I love about our community. Um, all right, so let's get started. I want to recognize a few folks that we have here. We have leadership from Gwinnett County, uh, our departments, uh, I saw Lewis Cooksey, 
uh, Lisa with their team. Uh, if you're with the county, put your, your hands up uh, so we can recognize you, all the work that you do in helping to lead us. We have Commissioner Watkins who's going to be offering us some comments here in just a second. Um, we also have members of the Gwinnett Community Advisory Task Force uh, that I would like to recognize. Senator Barrett is here. Uh, thank you for, for serving and for joining us this evening. I saw Beverly Path with the Gwinnett Historical Society is over here. Uh, Melvin Everson with uh, Gwinnett Tech, thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, did I miss anyone on the advisory task force? Um, all of these leaders in our community have contributed along with the public who's, who's participated in these conversations. Uh, greatly to what Rowan will become and, and I do want to give them a quick round of applause at the county locally for GCAT just all that they've contributed. Thank you. <laughs> we also have an and core to Rowan's mission is education and we have Regent Little who is also joining us so with the university system um, so thank you for, for joining us as well. And education, higher education, our future talent pipeline <laughs> Uh, is really the driver, the heartbeat of what Rowan will become and how do we enrich, connect uh, the young people that will create the future, right, through their professions, through a place like Rowan is core to, core to what we do. Um, so with that, I want to invite Commissioner Watkins to come up, uh, District 3 Commissioner. He's been a, a tremendous partner, ally, colleague as, as we've created Rowan, advocate for us, and uh, a great friend as well. So please come up and uh, offer some thoughts. Thank you, Mason. Good evening, everyone. While I have the floor, I would like to share what I think Rowan means to Gwinnett County for our future and for our children's future. The potential of economic development here with this project and the potential for jobs, the environmental conservation, and the high quality development that focuses on target industries are going to be great for Gwinnett County. After years of hard work, many people in the county and the state of Georgia officially announced Rowan's creation in August of 2020. Now, 15 months later, Gwinnett County continues to be a proud partner of the Rowan Foundation in creating a new civic and economic asset for our citizens. Since this announcement, the Rowan team has been engaged with the community, asking thoughtful questions, listening, and taking feedback seriously as it's been planning and implementation. Tonight, I'm excited for them to share some of the details so they can share some of the details and, and taking some of the feedback seriously so that we can plan. The development of Rowan is an exciting new chapter for Gwinnett County. Let me tell you why. As a pharmacist, having, as a pharmacist, okay. As a, as a pharmacist having um, research and development, especially in, in my aspect of nuclear pharmacy, being able to have uh, medical, agricultural, and environmental studies going on here, you just don't realize post-COVID how this is gonna put Gwinnett County on the map. Especially when some of your larger Fortune 50 pharma companies look at this area, look at what we offer in Gwinnett County and, and look at what we can produce from our fine high schools and our education system that we have here. So please engage with the Rowan staff and ask your questions because myself and, and your chairwoman are, are, are we, we are engaged and, and we are committed to this Rowan project. And, and that's why you see us at all of these events. So please ask the questions that you need to because we want to see this I want this to be in 10 years, Riley Durham what is actually the triangle in Gwinnett County. Thank you. Back this up now that we're tethered and we don't have a battery. Okay, so to, to get us started, um, the, the feedback that you all provided has created a, a framework of four topics which, we'll, which you'll find in the different corners of the room. So we're going to go through a brief presentation uh, with myself and my colleague Bob Hughes from HGOR is a key member of our, our team in planning and, and moving Rowan forward. Uh, after the presentation, you'll be able to go and speak with Rowan team members, uh, experts in each of these areas around these four topics. So the first is cultural heritage, environment in the public realm, transportation and connectivity, 
and finally, economic opportunity. So you'll be able to move around, ask questions, uh, document the questions, and we'll be able to, to track those as well. So our vision for Rowan is, is clear and it's really at our core, and it's to be a catalyst for education, research, innovation, and transportation through the creation of a global destination that recognizes the stewardship of the land as a cornerstone of an inspired community. That's a lot of words, but it's about who we are, and again, this idea of stewardship of the land. How do we use the valuable land resources that we, that we have uh, in order to fulfill our purpose? And we have core programmatic drivers around medicine, agriculture, and the environment. And these are really guideposts for us, where when we did early research to understand where are the strengths of our universities, where are the strengths of our colleges, where are the strengths of Georgia as a state. And these are the sectors that really stood out as areas where Rowan could both, perhaps we could fill gaps in the market, we can create new networks and connection points within existing industries that don't exist anywhere else, and this is how we're thinking about building this talent center that, that creates entirely new uh, ways to work together. Our vision is uh, its long term. It's a 2,000 acre project. This is not something that is developed overnight. It really is a multi-generational investment that is a community that is curated. Uh, ultimate build out will have around 22 million square feet uh, that we would be able to fit on the site and around 25 Per thousand projected jobs at 50% build out. Uh, again, th this takes time and the numbers, and we'll take a look at another map here that gives a little bit of, of insight into the scale, um, are significant, but, but they're going to be very intentional in, in how we do that, how we think about the environment, how we think about building a community, how we think about building partnerships. And this, you know, for those familiar these different of these different areas uh, in, in the region, Midtown Atlanta, you can see the at scale overlay of, uh, of the Rowan property going from Piedmont Park over to Atlantic Station, and then north and south all the way down to Mercedes-Benz, Athens, Georgia with the UGA campus. We could fit approximately three UGA campuses within the 2,000 acres of the Rowan property. Perimeter center, tremendous office density that's located there. The only thing we could find that was not, that is larger than Rowan is the Hartsfield Airport. Um, can't quite cover that up, uh, but, it's, but it's, it's sizable. And this is not to indicate this is the level of density that we will be building to, but it's just the, the opportunity that's there for that intentional curation of partnerships and development. And this is a tested model. Uh, we spent time at the foundation and looking around nationally and internationally to learn from other innovation communities, knowledge communities that are mission driven in similar ways that we are for Rowan. And the intent here in looking at places like Kendall Square or Utrecht, which is in the Netherlands, very much focused on the environment and wellness of the employees that are there, or 22 in Barcelona, another great startup, kind of very heavy on entrepreneurship and incubators, uh, or the University City in Philadelphia, or Research Tribal Park. Um, all of these have something to offer, a thread that we are weaving into how we approach Rowan, how we engage with the community, how we design a sustainable environment, how we design a community that is not just for those that are working there, but are for uh, everyone that lives in the area, family, community, students, to be able to come and visit and participate. And these are just examples that we look to to see what is the best practice that we can draw from. Uh, this is our full list of the Gwinnett Community Advisory Task Force. I highlighted the members that are here now, but these are the other leaders that spoke into Rowan and the work that we're doing. And what's important here is that we have such a great representation of the county and really of the state um, speaking into all aspects of how we've thought about Rowan moving forward. And we actually created a report, the GCAT uh, report and recommendations that had actions, things that we are implementing today at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and beyond, that you can go download a very comprehensive report on rowanlife.com under the news section. Uh, invites you to go take a look at that, and, and that's really informing our business plan and our actions uh, as we move forward. And out of GCAT, we had four drivers that have also been informing how this evening will unfold. And those are focusing on core priorities, core values of Rowan. The 
The first is collaboration, right? a, use, a word that we hear a lot, we, we may use too much, but for us it's really a part of our DNA. Rowan is not going to be successful if we are not collaborative as a community, if we're not collaborative with the public and the private sector, and how we really invest in each other to create a place that we would all be proud to call home tomorrow. And that's the vision that we have moving forward for being collaborative. It's a place that's accessible and affordable. Um, this is not exclusive. It is welcome and open to all. And we want people that have a vision for creating a better tomorrow and bringing their best and brightest intellect and relationships for, and looking for a place to call home. Rowan is the place where we want people to feel welcome and to be able to contribute. And we want it to be both financially accessible uh, and not all class A, really expensive office space, but flex lab space, open space, community space, uh, open park space, all that's available for, for people that want to want to come and contribute. Authenticity. We speak about the environment. It is a beautiful, wonderful piece of property that has been stewarded by generations prior to the foundation having the privilege of, of taking over that responsibility. And that's authentic to our uh, vision and how we move forward. How do we embrace that culture and history and true stewardship of the land that is a part of, of our authentic nature that we will also have as a part of our planning process. And then finally, inspiring. You know, I have two middle school kids and I love nothing more than to see them just be inspired by a new idea and how they not only learn something, but they can see themselves contributing to what can be and them seeing themselves in what role they would play in doing that. So having a place that's about inspiration is also important. We've got a lot of great photos. You, you, some of you may see yourselves in these photos. As we went out over the last year, great conversations engaging in March and April and June. Um, and we'll have some more tonight as we walk around and, and get more uh, questions from you all. And it wasn't just to have an event and to have discussion, to have a discussion, we documented those questions. Sticky notes, digitally, and that's what has been tremendously helpful as we have framed our thinking that, that Bob Hughes and our team will share as, as we go out and, and talk in more detail. But this is what we've done. It's, it's, it has not been a, um, uh, just a, a part of the process. It's really been infused into how we're moving forward into implementation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Bob to share some more about the plans going ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Mason. Yeah, it's exciting to be at this point. You know, we have spent a long, lot of time talking and listening, but now we're beginning to put all of that to action. And what we want to do tonight is share with you all not only where we are in that process, but how we go about that process. Is that, I hope you find it interesting. And if part of Rowan is about education, we want to help educate you all on how we think. And that may bring more questions back out for us. So four areas we're going to talk about is cultural heritage report, what we learned from that, what we've done in terms of transportation and connectivity. Uh, we're going to talk about the environment. Uh, as Mason said, the, you know, a cornerstone of an inspired community, stewardship of the land. So everything we do begins with understanding this land and how we build on it, around it, and in it. And then in, in the end, Mason will come back and talk a little bit about economic opportunity. So we've partnered with the University of Georgia's uh, College of Environment Design. They have a historical preservation program there. And they came down and studied the property, interviewed a lot of people, and we were able to come out with a map and pieces of the site that come out with recommendations. And some of the recommendations that we're moving forward in the planning of the site are, there's a farmhouse on the site called Williams Farmhouse. So, that we're looking to how that we preserve that and keep that as a as a part of the history of the site. To the north of the property, if many of you may know, there's an old mill, Bill's Mill, Freeman Mill. That site is totally out of anything we're going to build in, so it'll be preserved and hopefully be, as trails are built in that area, a stop along those trails so that we can tell that part of the story. Uh, the dirt roads that are on the site, we're going to preserve a portion of those dirt roads and turn them into part of our trail system. So you have this sense of the history of the land and the land itself being told, the story of that being told up through the new development of the property. From an environment standpoint, really how we build, how we build our cities, our towns, our communities, 
really needs to start from the environment. And what we look at here is things where we look at the elevation change on the site. We look at the cultural resource components. So you see those areas that are dark. That's where the mill's at, at. that's where the uh, Williams Farmhouse is. Some property that's on, that's some his, significantly historic components that aren't owned property we own, but we are adjacent to that, and we want to make sure that we're respectful of those as well. We then look at hydrology, floodplains, streams, these become important components. Steepness of slope. So if anybody's walked around in Piedmont, Georgia, you might recognize that we have these broad sort of flat ridges that drop down pretty steeply down to floodplains and streams. And you'll see on those steep slopes, a lot of times really big trees, because they've been there a long time. So it becomes a, an area that you look at and say, all right, how do I preserve that? And then we are looking at the vegetation. So then we take all of those, we turn them into black and white, and we lay them on top of each other into a composite analysis. And if you look at that, the darker areas in that analysis are the most environmentally sensitive and valuable parts of the property and cultural resource valuable and sensitive parts of the property. And the lighter areas are the least. And that tells us right off the bat, we want to conserve and preserve the darker areas, and we want to concentrate our development into the lighter areas. So that becomes a backbone of all of our thinking as we move forward. We really want to, if, if you're in Georgia now, one of the things that is amazingly uh, yeah, important to us is how we deal with water. And we're in the upper reaches of the watershed here, so it isn't like we have tons of water to waste. So how we deal with that and how we deal with not just you know, it, but the quality of it as water becomes extremely important. I think everybody's probably gone behind a Kroger grocery store. I, I shouldn't say that any particular brand, but behind the grocery store shops in, you see a hole in the ground, and that's the stormwater detention pit, right? Well, what you see here are stormwater detention facilities done as an aesthetic with a true environmental function to it. This is how we'll be dealing with our stormwater here on the site, setting the new standard we're moving forward with. In fact, we're pursuing with our first phase, I'll talk about it in a second, street system, what's called sites certification. It's like LEEDS, if you're familiar with LEEDS, the green building, but it's for projects that don't have a building, that just have site work. I learned last week that nobody has been able to take a street or road project and get it site certified. And we went through the scorecard and we have a chance to be the first project ever to get that certification because of how we're approaching it. One of the things that we did when we wrote our design guidelines is we said we're going to use 100% native plant material. And you can see in, you know, back in the back and some, some stuff that begins to talk about what's available and how we use it. But it's not just using that plant material to create an aesthetic landscape, it's using that plant material to create a functioning landscape. One that has habitat to it, one that does purify water, one that shows we can build and build in a way that is better for, you know, Mason said his children, my grandchildren, you know, really take that one seriously. The other thing that we've looked at here, and I think we told you all this as we got started, that we, one of the first things that we were going to do ahead of when we needed to do it, was we were going to do a, re, a, a development of regional impact traffic study, as you take it through RETA and the ARC. We have been through that process for this portion of, of the site, which would cover about 15 years worth of development on it. And we've gotten a notice of decision. So it begins to coordinate long-term, before we are really under construction of anything, the notion of how we plan for transportation and land use and the interface of that, which is a critical element to do. The other thing that we're about to do, which isn't even required, we're going to take our traffic data and we're going to put it into the ARC's regional computer traffic model. Because we want to look again long term, what is this going to do to the region long term, not just about this, this project. So we're really trying to create that dialogue between those institutions and we've been asked, and I think on December 8th, we're actually doing a presentation to Greta, the Georgia Regional Transportation Authority's uh, board about uh, uh, rolling. 
So again, we're opening those dialogues, we're opening those conversations to move forward. When you look at how we go about this, if you look on the left, you know, this was an early idea of how our road was going to fit in there. And you can see it ghosted behind the one on the right. Once we got real information, real topography information, that road began to adjust to fit the land, to minimize grading and minimize tree cutting. We had gone out on the site and had all the wetlands and streams uh, flagged and surveyed, so we were working with that. Except then we went out, had it all staked and walked it, and we found what was called a perched wetland. It's a wetland that just happens to occur. It's not really associated with any other body of water on a hillside. And of course, as luck would have it, we had a road going right through it. So you'll see a drawing around the corner over here showing where that is and how we're now adjusting that road. So you, you think about it in a big scale, you get information, then you put it on the ground and you go out and you walk it and you make the decisions that way. When we look at our, our streets, and, and we're, we're building streets, not roads, which is an interesting thing. Streets are available for people to walk. Streets are available for people to ride a bicycle. All means of transportation go on a street. But this is a cross, cross section of the street that we're looking at building. We will have a 14 foot wide multi-purpose path on one side of it, separated by about 10 to 12 feet from the travel lane of the car. So you don't feel like you're about to get clipped in the back of the knees by a car going by. We're making it where it's walkable in that sense. Median in the middle and both sides of it, we're going to use that to put stormwater into and create quality, water quality and infiltration opportunities within the roadway. It cuts down on the amount of piping. It cuts down on the velocity of the water leaving the site. It makes the water cleaner. So we're looking at a lot of things that you don't see in a typical street as to how we're approaching this and thinking about our infrastructure. And then when we talk about connectivity, mentioning that we have the trail system on one side, we're beginning to create a master trail system. The trail will go in along the river as part of the uh, sewer project. Ours will go in as part of our road and we'll figure out the connection to that. We actually have a trailhead coming up to the north right here. Right up in here is a trailhead that will lead to the trail along the river. So we're looking at that and we're having more meetings with the county about other, how we connect out. We've talked to Barra County who's interested in connecting to our trail system from the east. So we're really, again, trying to be this convener, this, this group that's saying, we're not just about our dot. We're not just about inside our borders. We're about how we build influences in the community around us. And then look, just looking at some imagery of the trails and the connectivity. Uh, and, and I gotta say this, I don't know how many people who here walk. When COVID hit two years ago, a year and a half ago, I lived in a building, they shut down our gym. I don't get exercise, I get kind of cranky. So my wife says, you gotta get some exercise. But, so I went out and I, I said, I turned into Forrest Gump, I just started walking. And within a year, I could walk four miles in under an hour. And I'll never not walk the rest of my life. It is the most fabulous thing. And you see multi-generations of people on that simple pathway, and it's a great thing. So that just that alone sets a tone of the core of, of what we're about. And with that, I think I hand it back to Mason. Thank you, sir. Um, so all of that does translate into economic impact and jobs. And this slide really captures what those projections are. That by 2035, uh, we have 18,500 jobs uh, within Rowan and economic activity of $3.8 billion. And then the projections from there on out at 50% build out at 2050 and then at full build out. Um, again, multi-generational patient development. And I think what's most important here is the, is the 18,500 jobs and as we scale up um, are not all PhD jobs. I don't have a PhD. <laughs> you know, we're going to have jobs that are for low skill levels, high skill levels, diversity of industry sectors, so that everyone that wants to find an opportunity for employment and be meaningful engaged, meaningfully engaged uh, within Rowan would be able to 
find a community, start up a new company, network with others, and that really be core to what is behind all of the economic data. And then our development timeline, we've heard from many folks that have an interest uh, in providing services and in, in proposing on work as it comes about, whether it's with regard to the trail or infrastructure uh, or uh, planning or once we have buildings in place and what does that look like. So this graphic, we'll have this on our website uh, by early next week. You're the first ones to see it, just a snapshot of the development timeline so that the community and, and contractors, vendors, suppliers, would I have an understanding of kind of, okay, where do, where do we fit in? Where, where is the opportunity? And those opportunities will be posted on our website as a request for proposals. We'll be posting them through publications across the region, across the state, uh, so that there is maximum opportunity for everyone to be aware of, of uh, projects as they come along. Uh, you can see pre-development right now where we are uh, going into the third quarter of 2022 when we expect to break ground on the first phase of infrastructure followed by a period of construction and infrastructure development real estate development and then ongoing operations so this is a snapshot again our website will have an area where you'll be able to connect with us and provide your business information um, the type of work that you do and interests and then that comes back to us and populates our internal uh, email distribution so that as projects come along we can we can send those out to the group and we're also focused on equity uh, we're focused on equity and looking at small women minority owned businesses and uh, having that as a part of our goal in uh, ensuring there's equal opportunity for people to be able to contribute so our board actually just today this is this is new news um, approved a, a 30% goal for the foundation uh, by contract amount that we go out and, and pull in from the community that that 30% would be coming from small women or minority owned businesses uh, for, for Rowan moving forward. So we're excited about this. This is about local hiring. It's about small business. It's about investing in our community and making sure there's a diversity of opportunities to be able to contribute. And here again, we'll have this on our website where you can register your company and be able to notify us if you are a small women or minority owned business. If you are not, that's not going to exclude anyone from being able to contribute and be a part of it, but it will be helpful information as we curate that larger list for our communications outreach. So with that, uh, here's our website, Again, general inquiries. We have a, an email list that we send out, kind of a blog e-newsletter where you can receive information about general updates, future events and gatherings, share ideas, and uh, to be able to stay informed. Uh, from here, we will go ahead and break out uh, and happy to meet with you, answer your questions, just hear your ideas. They don't all have to be questions. They could be things that inspire you, things that, that we need to be thinking about from your perspective as we continue to move forward. So